Perfect. It is in full screen mode. I hope you can see it the way I'm seeing it. Wonderful. Uh, okay. Can I begin, Salma? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes, perfect. Okay. So I think the Salma wanted me to speak to um, in today um, to today about the founder challenges that happen post first VC fund funding, right? And this is a very important topic because we at Your Nest are early stage uh, fund. So we generally do pre-series A. And when people get funding, they want to declare victory that, okay, we have arrived, which is true to a certain extent. It's a big milestone, but there are a lot, lot of things to be done after that. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm a big, just let me see, why is it not changing? Yeah. So uh, this quotation is a very favorite uh, quotation of mine. The smart people learn from everything and everyone. Average people from their experiences and stupid people already have all the answers. Uh, it is very well captured uh, for a startup world. Uh, I have seen the, the best founders are ones who are listening very carefully, learning at every opportunity and trying to not make the mistakes that have been made by others. So this quotation is very favorite of mine, especially as it applies to entrepreneurs. Very quickly about my credibility on what brings me to this stage. Um, I have had tremendous uh, experience with some of the biggest in the world. I started my career and worked with both Hewlett and Packard, founders of HP. I worked with Michael Dell, you see picture on the right top. You see with John Chambers on the left-hand side bottom, that's John Chambers of Cisco, the most successful CEO, hired CEO ever. And obviously everyone knows on the bottom right is Steve Jobs. Uh, and the poster that he gave me uh, says, if you can't read it, it says Vivek and team, um, thanks for being there and uh, helping us. We couldn't have done without you. I signed Steve Jobs. So I have had tremendous experiences working with some of the global leaders, and I want to share what I have learned from them with you. I have six patents. I have written two books. On the top right corner, you see my invention where I invented an instrument. I uh, patented it and licensed it to a Boston company, and that was sold um, all over the world for 17 years before uh, the the patent royalty was was done. It is still selling, but I don't get royalties anymore. I have, uh, world has been kind. I have uh, won many awards, but I think the most important ones is um, uh, one on the second from the right bottom. That's IT Man of the Year in 2016, and uh, on the right bottom is Who's Who of United States in 2000. So hopefully that gives you some background about me. And this is another focus picture of the instrument that I had invented. I have done three startups. Uh, I have seen three outcomes from the startup, uh, good, bad, ugly, I have seen everything. So that is what brings me to talk to you today. Let's start with uh, seven things that I want to share with you. That is after you have received first round of funding, not the angel funding I'm talking about, but first round of pre-series A, venture funding. So here is what you need to do. Refine your space even better. You have gotten the funding because you were able to convince investors that this is the space you want to go after. This is the market that is available. That is all true. But now before you scale, the money you are getting is to scale. Before you scale, make sure that you know the space very, very well. And for that, you have to do a, a good uh, understanding of competitive landscape. You need to know your competition inside out. Sometimes I say better than even your own products and companies. Find a role model company in or outside your industry. And this word is very interesting. I use it all the time because when I ask the startup people to say, who is your competition? And they will say this competition, this competition, but I am better than all. Uh, they don't do this, I do this. They don't do this, I do this. Okay, so you are the best. 
Now the question I turn around and say, okay, who is your role model company? And they generally struggle. So I encourage entrepreneurs to find a role model company at the stage of funding and see what they can learn from them. It's not about just saying that I'm better than them. You are not going to be better than the rest of the world. It is important for you to be humble and learn from every opportunity. So it is very important that you identify a role model company, which you can learn something from. Sharpen your differentiated value proposition. Uh, this, these three words I use all the time, differentiated value proposition. That you can sustain. Your startup is not going to be built in one or two years. It will take five or 10 years for you to build a startup. Can your differentiated value proposition sustain this time period? Very important questions, and I'll come back to this later as well. And avoid confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is that you always find a reason to sort of say that I'm right. Uh, this is not a great situation. And I have seen the most successful entrepreneurs have less of confirmation bias. I'm not saying you do not have conviction. You have to have conviction in what you want to achieve and so on. But you need to also listen to people and avoid confirmation bias. So I think know your space better, know your products better. Number two, understand your TAM better. Total available market, right? I see so many startups make this mistake. So, so many pitches I see for IoT these days, Internet of Things, it's a trillion dollar market. But your startup is not going to address trillion dollar market. Nobody can. Not even Cisco's of the world can address trillion dollar market. So find out what is your segment that you are going to address and what is, the, uh, what is your focus area? Your TAM has to be very, very, very neatly defined if you want to go after that market. So consider the segment that you are going to go after. In that segment, what is your TAM? So let us say you, within IoT, you have a product that is in healthcare. You have a product, even healthcare may be a several billion dollars market. Now within healthcare, let's say you have a product that converts the ICU beds or uh, converts normal beds, hospital beds into mini ICU beds. And this is a real company I'm talking about. I'll give the example later. What is the market for that? And that is your TAM. Why I'm stressing so much about TAM is because if you don't define your segment properly, you will mess up your product, business model, marketing, and sales, which means essentially the whole company. And then you will have to pivot, and pivot is never kind. Never kind. So pivot is not a sexy word that, oh, I pivoted. You pivoted because you made some mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes but you don't want to make mistakes for the heck of it. So if your TAM is wrongly defined, if your segment is wrongly defined, your product will be incorrect, your business model will be incorrect, your marketing approach will be incorrect, and even your sales will be incorrect. So this is a very important point. Point number three, improve uniqueness and competitiveness of your product. And how are you going to do that? Well, simplicity and user experience are extremely important. This is the time. Up to now, you had started with some uh, angel funding or some friends and family round, or you bootstrapped yourself. You didn't have money really to improve the product from simplicity and, uh, and user experience. Well, now put some money and resources behind it. People love simplicity. People love user experience. If, if anything, look at Apple's products as an example. That's what they do. And having worked with Steve Jobs, I can tell you that these things are so important. They create a cult-like following for your product. So it's very important. This is the time now to invest some money and effort into this. Create IP. Up to now, you didn't have money for patents. You probably didn't even think about that patent. Maybe you have identified a patentable idea, but very rarely by this time, people have patents. I'm a big fan of patents. I have six US patents myself. And I can tell you that every startup that is in some deep technology area 
uh, either through business model or through technology should create intellectual property and patent it as soon as possible. Uh, the extreme of that is that startups come and tell me that uh, they, 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 have, they have 20 patents. You don't need 20 patents at this stage of startup, but you might be much, much, much better off if you have one or two. So focus on that and focus on continuous innovation. So many startups come, they have an innovative idea today. Ask them, will this idea sustain you for next five, 10 years? They don't know the answer. Competition is not going to sit still. They will also innovate. So what is the mechanism you are putting to have continuous innovation? It's a separate topic. I don't have time here to cover it, but it's important to put in process continuous innovation in your startup, no matter how small it is. But again, this is the time when you have received some funding. This is the time, hopefully by series A or something, you would have one or two patents. You would have product that is simple and um, has great user experience. Sharpen your business model. This is the time now to figure out the business model before you scale. This is the time to, because if you scale the wrong way, your money is gone. You, you will again, like uh, you will either run out of money or you will have to pivot. All those are very difficult things to deal with. So this is the time to sharpen your business model. Make sure it is capital efficient and scalable. Uh, I'm not saying you um, don't focus on growth. I, I think this, this thing can be debated for hours, whether uh, growth is important or uh, capital efficiency is important, uh, scalability is important. In my mind, uh, at least I would like to hear, to see that uh, capital efficiency is there and model is scalable, is scalable. So it's important to focus on that at this juncture when you have just raid, raised uh, venture capital funding. Now, if you are talking about technology startups, which is what I am told that the audience today is, these are all technology people. I call them three gods of the technology team. This is the time now to go and hire these three gods. Who are these gods? Product manager, industrial designer, and user experience person, and architect. Why I call them three, three gods? Because these are the people, three people who will decide success or failure of your startup. It is that important. Now, what happens generally when the startups um, start, so to say, with bootstrap budget or through friends and family round, the CEO says, I'm the product manager because it is his idea. And there's another partner generally who will say, I'm the CTO. So the architect is handled by the CTO. The industrial designer and user experience is handled by the CTO and the product manager role is handled by CEO. At, at this stage, this is not sustainable. You have raised a million dollar or whatever from venture capital. You will be consumed by other things and your time and effort to do your these roles will reduce, 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 reduce. And ultimately you are not paying attention to the product manager role, which is actually critical for your success in the long run. So now that you have a million dollar or whatever you have raised, this is the time to hire these three gods, hire the best you can. And I always say that if you can hire three A class people in your team, these should not be B class, C class people. If you do that, I think you are halfway there in your startup, especially technology startup. Now scale your business, right? Um, build your teams, um, scale your product, services, marketing, sales support, all of these functions have to be built, multiply revenues and margins. All of that has to ex scale exponentially and get ready for the next round of fundraising. So, so here is the dilemma. Like I said, when people raise the first round of venture capital fund, they celebrate, they are happy, they think they have arrived, all right. Everything is right, no problem with that. But you don't have much time to celebrate. You need to put your house in order for the next round. So my advice to startups is that, let's say the next round is after a year or 18 months. Create a pitch for 18 months from now and say, okay, 
let's assume that you are good giving that pitch to some VC. And what will you say to the VC for raising series A or series B, whichever round you are going after? What are the metrics you have to show? So you will have to show the team. Have you built that? You will have to show IP, intellectual property or patent. Do you show that? You would have to show the product and the competitiveness of the product against competition, um, nail it down. You would have to show customer traction and actually decent revenue. Have you nailed it down? And you may have even have to show global customers if in your pitch on series A or series B, you are going to say I'm raising five or $10 million for going global. They want to see an evidence of that during this period. So create that pitch that will help you raise your next round of funding. And then that gives you the matrix to focus on so that you can actually go and uh, create your startup, which will be able to raise the next round of funding. Now expand into new products and geographies, but be very surgical. I see this, uh, this problem all the time. Uh, if you have raised uh, $500,000 or a million dollars, um, it may not be enough money, depending on, of course, your product and, and so on, to go global. Uh, it is not good enough for that. So I think it is very important that you select your geographies very, very carefully based on the resources you have. Uh, maybe India first, maybe uh, Southeast Asia first, maybe US first. It depends on on the market. I'm 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 part of a company that that went for products in US first, India later. Now that may make sense for a certain company, but in many companies we have products which are India first and then expanding to other markets. So be very surgical in your choice based on the resources you have. And don't go to US especially. Everyone claims that it's a big market and I'll go and win customers there. Well, easier said than done. There are a lot of customers there and yes, it is the largest market, but there are a lot of competition there too. And is your product ready for that? So it is very important that you pay attention to that. And obviously then drive rapid growth. So these are the things you have to do. Another very important and favorite topic of mine, if you haven't yet, get mentors. Ideally, you should already have mentors, but if you still ha don't have a mentor, get one. Good mentors tell you what you don't want to hear. You don't need people who are just seconding your thought. You need people who are challenging you and saying, no, you are wrong. And you should have appetite to hear that. So it is very important that you have a mentor and have a trust and relationship so that the mentor is free to say, this is BS, this is not going to work, et cetera. You can have more than one mentor. Um, you know, I have had several mentors throughout my life. My children have mentors. And so you can have multiple mentors, but at least one mentor for a startup world should have been there, done that it is very important that at least one mentor has been there, done that in your type of product or service, okay? So for example, if your mentor comes from uh, 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 some kind of e-commerce space and your product is SaaS and um, an enterprise product, that person hasn't been there, done that. They will advise you some some phenomenal advice they can give you because obviously they have, they have succeeded, but you need at least one mentor. You can have that person as mentor as well, but you need at least one mentor who in similar type of space has been there, done that, very, very important. So these are the seven things I ask startups to do when they get first round of funding. Uh, before I close and maybe take a couple of questions, I want to tell you that I have started um, an initiative my, uh, myself, um, which is I want to mentor a million young people, okay? Uh, I, I have uh, given myself this challenge that I want to mentor a million young people. And how can I do that? Well, to mentor a million, I have to 
established credibility and I'm launching my book in early 22. It will be released in January, February. Now with this COVID situation, it may move here and there, but early next year, it, it should be th there. And uh, this book will act as your mentor, as mentor for your startup, as mentor for you as a person, and as a mentor for you, for your life. All my lessons learned and the thousands of people I have mentored are actually written in the book so that it can help people. And this is how I want to reach a million people. Another thing I'm doing is to reach million people, I have to work through social media. And um, uh, I have these channels. You can take a picture of this if you want. Um, join me, connect to me in the social media channels. I have started mentoring already. There are articles, there, is, there are videos, there are uh, you know, quotations and some of my experiences shared. So join me in one or more of these social media um, and then obviously the book will be launched and we'll be discussing book uh, in, in these social media channels. So please take a picture of it if you want. And um, that will be happening in early uh, 2022. So with that, I think for startups who have just raised, raised funding, do these seven things and you will be happy and you will hopefully raise the next round and the next round and the next round and build a very, very successful company. My best to all entrepreneurs. I, I must, before I give it back to Vivek, is that entrepreneurs are phenomenal people. Entrepreneurship is amazing career choice. You learn in two years of entrepreneurship more than you may learn in 10 years of job in some other company. You may learn in two years more than what you will learn in an MBA. So entrepreneurs rejoice work your tails off because entrepreneurship is not easy, uh, but uh, enjoy the journey. And uh, if you do the right things, uh, all the things I've, I've told you, you will be very, very successful. With that, all the best. And Vivek, if you want me to hang on and answer one or two questions, I can, or you want to close, that's fine too. No, we have a few questions. Uh, we've had hundreds of people uh, also on stream that are watching. And uh, we have some questions coming in here as well. So I'd just like to take a few moments and uh, pose those questions to you. One of the questions uh, here is, uh, how do you differentiate a mentor from a coach? Um, how would you yeah, do that? Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent point. So th these words are interchangeably used actually, liberally. Uh, they are different though. Uh, coach generally is used for improving a particular skill in a person. For example, they'll say, I have a leadership coach. I have a sports, in a sports, you will see that I have a coach who is helping me with my batting skills or badminton skills and so on. Those are people who are called coach. Um, in, in professional world, like I said, leadership coach could be, communication coach could be, etc. Mentors are generally people who have much broader uh, stake in you as a person, and they are trying to help you not only succeed in your personal life, but also professional life and uh, even your startups and so on in a, in a big way. They have big stake in your success. And that is the difference between a mentor. And so mentor uh, can also give you advice uh, about your life, about your career choice, about your education, about executive education that you may want to go after. Uh, about any aspect of life. So mentors are people who cover all of the life parameters. Coaches are generally uh, very focused on a specific skill set, and that's the difference. But get a good coach, get a good mentor, anything to start with is a good start. So uh, one more question that's coming up is, uh, you know, how, how would you suggest recruiting a mentor? Like, how, how do we find a good one? Yeah, so so in our uh, in our mythology, they say when you are ready, the guru arrives, right? So first thing is to do get ready for yourself, right? Um, uh, how hard you want to, just like you woo your girlfriend or what or, or wife or something, you have you, you you don't go and just say, would you be my wife? And she says yes. No. You are going round and round, dancing and singing and going around gifting and this and that. So I think it's 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 very serious business. Once you have identified uh, a mentor that you would like, you will have to approach them. Um, 
for example, let's say you say, I want Mr. Narayan Murthy to be my mentor. Well, how can, how can you approach that? It's not going to work easily. So I think the important thing is to find a mentor who is approachable at your stage first. Everyone does not need a Ratan Tata or a, or a Narayan Murthy to mentor them. So uh, find one who is right at your stage. Mentors can change throughout life. They have changed for, for my life uh, uh, at various stages. And then go after them and be prepared and tell them why you have selected them. If you have done your groundwork on why you are selecting them as a mentor and you get a chance to explain it to them and there is truth in it and you are ready for it, means that person may tell, tell you that this is not going to work. You don't have leadership skills. Are you ready to hear all that and improve upon it? If you are, mentor will say yes, but it's not a simple thing that you go and Google search and find a person and say, this is my mentor. It's not going to work like that. Awesome. One more question, uh, I'd just like to pose. Can an investor in a company also be a mentor to the founder? So they all are generally, if I'm investing in a company, generally I'm mentoring those uh, portfolio companies. Uh, but because I have invested in it, um, the founders always put their best foot forward um, and tell me the things that I should be hearing. Um, and mentor is someone you can go to and say that, look, I have, I have no clue what to do. I am out of my wits. I am lo I'm losing money or I'm running out of money and so on. So I think it is better that a mentor, you, you, you can have a mentor as an investor. You can even have a mentor within your company. If you are working for Cisco and there is a person there who can mentor you, no harm in that. Learn as much as uh, possible from them, but have a mentor outside that also who has, who you can talk so freely. So let's say your performance in Cisco is not as good Will you discuss all that openly with a Cisco mentor? Probably not. That's why you need a mentor outside also. But this is exact reason, Vivek, why I wrote this book. I, uh, and the purpose is that this book will act as your mentor. And if you, if, frankly, if you, if you act on everything the book says, you will arrive 